Asiatic Studies at Oxford University. He has written and spoken widely on the Middle East over the past two years with a focus on Assyrians. Please join me in welcoming our dean. Hello? I would know of Asim Chad Yuka Chadan. It's a privilege to have your attention. My goal, our goal, in the time that we have, is to impart two central ideas, which I think are two sides of the same reality. Two sides of the same reality, the essential reality facing the question of our existence as an Assyrian nation. The first, is to thoroughly unmask the idea that our salvation lies in external advocacy, and moreover that our, that our attachment to the hope that our salvation, salvation will come externally is actively harming us and preventing us getting to our second thesis from realizing the necessity of developing our own self-reliance and self-empowerment in order to survive as a people. This condition can be framed in terms of what we might call the Syrian exceptionalism, which is a curious mixture of self-loathing and self-regard. Self-loathing because we don't really believe or act as if we do believe that we can do anything truly meaningful or lasting for ourselves and by ourselves, or that we should focus on developing our own capacities as a matter of urgency in response to our ongoing genocide. And self-regard because we continue to believe or act as if we do and in terms of precious time and energy spent, those two things mean the same thing in practice. That the justness, righteousness, the, legit the, the legitimacy of our cause should, and therefore will, attract support from the Chaya. This underpins the many myths that have been constructed within and about ourselves. We are very keen to internalize and accept every excuse that is given to us by foreigners for not helping us. One such excuse, for example, that we're all familiar with, is disunity. If you just take a cursory look, however, at causes supported currently by the United States and the West, and I'll give one example, and I won't go into too much political detail, because I think everyone here will be very familiar with it, is the Syrian opposition. The Syrian opposition to Bashar al-Assad, um, if it can even be called one thing, is fragmented into hundreds of militias, perhaps over a thousand, absolutely disunited, operationally, ideologically, in terms of patronage, and so on. And yet, it's common to hear a Syrian still say that, for example, the fact that some groups use other names other than Assyrian when presenting our case to Western powers is the reason that they don't take us seriously. So contrast claims over that confusion with, with what's happening with the Syrian opposition in relation to the West. Simply because their interests are aligned, they're supporting a cause which is deeply, deeply fragmented. So it simply isn't empirically true to say that our lack of unity has prevented us from attracting support. And yet sadly, we continue to injure ourselves by perpetuating this belief within our people. That the real variable is us, but not what we do to empower ourselves, but the variable how we present our case to foreign powers, whether it's which names we use to describe our people, which names we use to describe our land, the way we approach our relationships with politicians, the degree of our professionalism, and so on. So we look at examples of self-help that have led to the empowerment of peoples and causes and dismiss them without examining them meaningfully, instead jumping to the conclusion that the variable in their success has been lobbying, because some of these causes are involved in lobbying and appear to be good at it. As Michael has shown, it's also true that we have succeeded in producing results within the terms understood by advocacy itself. Legislation, language, even policy. What has failed is the result of this advocacy to actually help us. And this shows that there are two tiers of reality when it comes to international affairs and sponsorship and advocacy and all the things that comprise and underpin um, the relation between, between states. Is the world of language, the world of seminars, journalism, institutions, and so on, resolutions. And the world of how things actually work on the ground, 
in which the absence of mechanisms and structures of self-reliance can often render the process of external engagement null and void. So to reiterate the most important point, it is only and until we realize that we are truly alone that we will take the extremely difficult steps necessary to maximize the assertion of our agency as a response to the conditions that we find ourselves in. What distresses us is that we have suffered so greatly without, de without developing not only the instincts for survival, but that we are bereft of the institutions and the organizations that are the fruits of those instincts. Our reaction to ISIS, for example, to take the most pressing and recent example, was to pursue with even more vigor the very means that have left us vulnerable, namely more advocacy. Both because it is so deeply rooted in our psyches and because our lack of transnational development forced us to. This approach shows itself most agonizingly in the case of Syria, as a country previously which was resistant to lobbying. It was always an autarky, it was a closed country. And as international conflict developed within its borders, and the fate of the country became truly a zero-sum game of violent, every man for himself survival, the, the need for direct assistance and support to our people, as opposed to governmental advocacy, in order to survive, was made even clearer. And yet it was almost entirely absent in our case. To consider something like genocide recognition, and I, I bring, uh, I want to go back to this because it is a deeply significant moral point. I mean, there's no, there's nothing more fundamental, no fate more fundamental that a people can undergo than genocide. And this, these comments are, are totally impersonal because I, like everyone else who's been involved in Syrian affairs, has been involved in the pursuit of genocide recognition over the last year or two. But there is something perverse about it. Why? When we know what happened and is happening to us, is genocide. And we know that genocide recognition does not entail action. Are we so keen to pursue it? On the one hand, we are measuring the weight of the simple opinion of Nakhraya, specifically those in developed Western countries that we look to as paragons of virtue, over our own. And on the other, we are continuing to labor in the belief that the actions of Western governments will morally align with the profundity of our cries to them. It sounds to me to say that there's a combination of vanity and masochism in this, which Michael's examples show how, how just how deeply rooted this, this mentality is within us, that even when those governments themselves were saying that we're not going to do anything, in other words, even though genocide is the most serious thing and we recognize that according to international agreements and so on, it doesn't compel us to act. We actually held them in higher regard than they held themselves, which is um, very saddening and distressing. And so. There is no model or precedent for what we are currently doing as a nation in an organized sense that has yielded results. And there are significant precedents for self-reliance that we might believe are down to lobbying successes, but we're very empirically and clearly down to self-reliance and self-empowerment. I mean, the three most pertinent ones uh, are, are Jews, Armenians, and Kurds. I mean, to take three um, local examples. And of course, our part of the world is, is uh, unusually um, um, numerous when it comes to threatened peoples. In the case of these causes, Jews, Armenians, and Kurds, finally, after incredible struggle, their own people made their causes strong enough to deal substantially with external forces. It was not given to them, nothing was given to them, until they empowered themselves so much that they were able to assert themselves in a way which forced other people to take them into, uh, into, in, into account. And crucially, these peoples could then afford to absorb the blows of betrayal and inconsistency which followed from their engagements externally. We haven't been able to absorb those blows due to our lack of internal capacities and legitimate transnational institutions purpose towards and relentlessly active in the pursuit of self-reliance. The establishment of the Assyrian Confederation of Europe, which has the potential to be one of the most significant moments in our recent organizational history, should take these lessons into account and not serve merely as a vehicle for the unity of existing bodies or communities but orient, orientate the entire Assyrian nation towards a design in which standards and principles of nationalism are enforced institutionally. I would like us to all think about the almost innumerably vast, way, vast number of ways in which the citizens of countries, i.e. territorially bound countries, 
almost by virtue really of existing within that state, reinforce and enable each other to survive and flourish. To give a very childish um, and, and basically outdated example, but it, it serves some kind of illustration, taxis go to public universities, which train engineers, who build bridges across which you drive. That's a banal illustration, but it's merely intended to convey a state of collective being that I wish to see with the Syrians, where every organizational success, every individual success, every project success, indirectly or directly, empowers and assists and substantiates all other efforts globally. We're all here because we love our people, but we're also aware that the basis of nationalism is deeply instinctive and survival-oriented at the root. In terms of how we behave and think in relation to one another and other people and the Khraya, we know that no one can help us but us. We all feel that necessity, that survival instinct, individually and socially, familiarly, but we don't organize along those lines. And that gap between our instincts, our internal knowledge, and our reality as a people, our organizational reality, our collective reality, is why there is an extraordinary waste of Assyrian potential in current existence, and why there is so much distress and exhaustion in relation to our work. In providing this vision of what we might call Shultanuta at La Ara, sovereignty without land, the empowerment, the assurances, the undergirding of a state without being attached to territory. And when I say at La Ara, Shultanuta at La Ara, this idea is not at all about giving up on land. No Assyrian could ever abandon our attachment to Assyria, our attempts to reclaim what is ours, or to sever our ties with our land, which is not only the root but the source of replenishment for our culture, or the permanent dream of a free Assyria. It is a response, a necessary one, to successful genocides against us on our own land. We've had our agency taken from us by force in the Middle East, and we have also willingly handed our agency over to Nafraya, with our expectation that they will come to our salvation because our cause is just, we deserve it, and because they are powerful. It is a response to the knowledge that if we are to meaningfully support efforts for us to remain in Assyria, to return to Assyria, or to survive outside it, and all three of these aspects should be supported by our institutions simultaneously and in a mutually reinforcing way, it's all down to us to do so. Once we have an organizational reality that actually understands, takes into account, and fully empowers us based on our reality as a global nation, that will forever serve as the means by which we maximize the strength of our connection to each other, and will allow us to transcend the illusion that even our homeland, the Aspro divide, will gradually destroy us. We've undergone decades, if not centuries, being destroyed and uprooted, having our land, our culture, our people taken from us, our dignity taken from us. And we continue to lack the belief that we ourselves have the power and the freedom to rely on ourselves for survival. But if we finally build our own self-reliance and empowerment, because we have made it by and for ourselves, no one can take it from us. But that also means that if we fail to realize the necessity of self-reliance and self-empowerment as the only thing that can guarantee our existence and, we hope, our flourishing, only we are to blame for it. Thank you.